is God's grace to you limited? When Jesus was bleeding and dying on the cross, two thieves were hung on either side of him. The first thief turned to him and said, come on, Jesus, supernatural boy, prove it. Get us off these crosses and then we'll believe in you. Second criminal turned to the first criminal and said, you idiot, we bleed and die here because we deserve it. But this Jesus, he's the innocent, holy, pure son of God. And that second criminal turns to Jesus and says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus did not say, whoa, time out. First, you got to get down and work in a soup kitchen. First, you got to get down and live a sexually pure life. First, you got to get down and rub out all your meanness and hatred of people. No. He looked that guy in the face and said, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. That is grace. And God's grace is unlimited. But that is partially false. God will not force his grace on anybody. God will not force himself into your life or my life. And you see, one of the things that I so appreciate about Jesus Christ is he does not use the tactic of forceful, overwhelming persuasion. You have a decision to make, and God respects your free will. I have a decision to make, and I have to make a decision. You're free, I'm free. That's the way God created us. Now, by his Holy Spirit, he reaches out and draws us to himself. Yes, he loves us, and yes, he offers us his grace, but if we push back, he doesn't force us. So in one sense, yes, God's grace is unlimited. God offers forgiveness to everybody, including the thief on the cross who died beside Christ. How do we reconcile the old like, teachings in uh, Leviticus, for example, about homosexuals needing to be stoned to death with the New Testament teachings of, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself and, you know, everybody is safe, that kind of stuff. Okay, well, first point is the New Testament does never, never says that everybody is saved. The New Testament teaches if you, if you put your faith in Christ, then you will be saved. But you raise a difficult question, the issue of homosexuality. All right, first point, I have to apologize to homosexuals for the way they have been viewed as dirt by, quote, Christians, unquote. That is false. Guys, what is a man? What is a woman? If there is no God, we are all accidental collections of atoms. And yet Jesus Christ says, no, we're not accidental collections of atoms. We're human beings created in his image. My value has nothing to do with my sexual behavior or sexual lifestyle. My value has everything to do with the fact that I'm created in the image of God. Now, I used to work among prostitutes in inner city Boston. And I understand what a woman says to me. Cliff, I love to be a prostitute. It's the easiest way for me to make money. I understand the rationale there. But what I communicate to my prostitute friends is, but guess what, ma'am? You're more valuable than that. To prostitute yourself, to make money, is to degrade yourself. Why? Because God created our sexuality for a reason. And that reason is, in Genesis 2.24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So please, my prostitute friend, don't play the prostitute anymore. Trust in Christ. Base your identity on him, not on your ability to make money as a prostitute with sex. And then seek to honor him in living a sexually pure life. And that would be true for every one of us, regardless of whether we're heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual, or whoever. We're all equally valuable because we're all created in the image of God. We're all sinners. I certainly am. And that's why I've trusted in Christ that he bled and died on a cross for my sin to forgive me and give me eternal life. And now, because I trust in Christ, I seek to live a sexually pure life. I blow it at times. I lust. That's wrong. That's sinful. And yet I'm consistently surrendering to Christ and asking him to purify me, to purify my thoughts and motives. And that applies to every homosexual, every bisexual, every heterosexual, every prostitute, every eunuch. Does that make any sense? It does. Okay, where would the problem be? So the, the problem for me seems to be the difference in 
action, I guess, in, in so a lot of justification that I see for sort of anti-homosexual rhetoric comes from things that are written in the Old Testament. So I guess I was kind of wondering okay. what your thoughts were on, you know, for example, the, I really should know which letter this was. I think it was Paul. Yes. With um, the, I want to say it was letter to the Romans, where he was discussing the yes. difference between Romans the, one. the Jews that were pra practicing Christianity and the Gentiles that were practicing Christianity. And um, with the, basically it came down to a question of whether or not the Old Testament laws still apply. You bet. All right, when you read the Old Testament, you have to learn to make a distinction between the Mosaic law and the moral law. Mosaic law, moral law. The Mosaic law was the law for a theocracy, the nation of Israel. And you were to execute a rebellious son. Why? Because there's no police force. There's no national defense system. And if your child has rebelled grievously, that child was to be executed. Now that seems harsh to me. I'm sure it seems harsh to all of us. And yet that was the way the theocracy of Israel ran at that time in order to maintain order, in order to respect people and protect people from being attacked. All right, now when it comes to sexuality, all the nations around the Israelites celebrated homosexuality, bisexuality. Julius Caesar was every woman's man and every man's man. So Julius Caesar was bisexual. The Egyptians celebrated homosexual sex and bisexual sex. The Greeks, obviously, Socrates and Plato's, celebrated having sex with little boys. Underage, boys, what we would call underage. So Israel was surrounded by all these cultures that were incredibly chaotic sexually. And so God says very clearly to the Israelites, you are to be different. I have created male and female. I've created male and female to make a lifelong commitment to each other. And then within that context to enjoy sex and to have sex outside of that context is to degrade yourself and to degrade your sex partner. And yes, it was pretty strong in Leviticus that if you practice homosexual sex, if you practice bestiality, I mean, there's a Hittite law that says there is nothing wrong with you having sex with a mule or a horse. So they celebrated having sex with animals. And God is calling the Israelites to be different sexually and to say, no, you've got to acknowledge that God created sex for a purpose. One man, one woman committed to each other till death parts us. So that's what's part of what's going on there. Stuart, how do you respond to that? Well, and then you brought it up, the transition into the New Testament. You have the stoning of the adulteress. And Jesus says, for any of you who have not sinned, throw that first stone. And obviously everyone's convicted and says, okay, clearly I've sinned before. So that's John chapter 8. Or elsewhere you have, in history, the three and four hundreds A.D. I don't know if you know the story of Telemachus, the monk who hopped in to the Roman Colosseum and got in the way of two gladiators and wanted to stop the gladiatorial games, that is one of the biggest changes in ancient history and even history today when it came to human rights and equality. Because then all of a sudden you had an emperor converting because of Telemachus and said, you know what, Roman Colosseum, gladiatorial games, done with, done with. All are equal, we are going to safeguard everyone. And obviously, so many people lost money when you take away the Roman Colosseum and what was going on in there, and yet equality came in. But then, even later on, a female bishop said, no longer are we going to go about stoning children. That was in the 400s AD. She was Christian. She said, all are equal, and we're not to stone. We're to live by grace and understanding, yes, there needs to be obedience from kids, but we're not going to stone them. So it gets back to the point of internally in the New Testament, as well as historically, outside of the New Testament, we have all kinds of documents showing that in the Mosaic ancient history, yes, you had a theocracy that was part of a brutish culture. And I wish there was more context to why God called for the stoning of the adulteress, but mainly the homosexual as well as the child in the Old Testament out of St. Leviticus, or why when Elijah is walking and two boys start calling him baldy, and a bear comes out, he calls the bear out, and the bear kills the two boys. Well, contextually speaking, 
Those were not boys. They were probably y'all's age. And they were tremendously nasty to Elijah and, and really going after him physically. And so God judged them. Now, you could say that's brutish, though. Come on, why not a slap on the wrist? Why a bear coming down and, and mauling them to death? And yet that Old Testament, again, was setting up the Mosaic and moral law in such a way where there was a narrowing, but right out of Matthew 19, all of a sudden you see the new covenant coming, and it's a narrowing basis of understanding grace and how Jesus handles people differently from a brutish ancient Near Eastern culture that was based on a theocracy, the Old and New Covenant. You're a delight. You're thoughtful, and you think hard, and I appreciate that, and we appreciate that. Thank you, sir. How can that God allow people like rapists or like sexist or even better yet, like Christians who claim to follow God, who abuse um, yeah. people who are part of like the LGBTQ community? Like, how does that make sense? It doesn't. Great point. A Christian abusing a gay person, somebody in LGBTQ, that's wrong. It's hypocrisy. Christ didn't abuse anybody. He loved all people, but he also spoke the truth uncompromisingly. And he balanced those two magnificently. So, I as a follower of Christ am commanded to love all people. Difficult people, toxic people, even my enemy. Christ calls me to love them. Now how? How on earth can I love someone who's being a mean son of a gun to me? By experiencing the love of Christ. When I begin to realize that at the heart of the cosmos, there's a God of love. When I begin to trust in him and allow Christ to live within me in the person of the Holy Spirit, that radically changes my view of reality. You know, do you give, do you give any money away to the church or to people? You do. Giving money away is the opposite of self-preservation. It's the opposite of survival of the fittest. So why is it that you'd be generous and give money away when you believe that self-preservation is what life is all about? And obviously the answer to that is you don't believe that self-preservation is all that life is about. You believe that at the heart of the cosmos, because you're a Christian, is a God of love who has been incredibly generous. And that's why giving your money away to hurting people is not stupid. It is smart because it shows that you have a view of reality that includes eternity, a view of reality that includes a generous God at the heart of the cosmos who has generously blessed us and given us more than enough gifts. And because you know this God who is so generous, you want to be generous. Bravo. Keep going. Don't stop. Why? Because that's truth. That is reality. Now, if someone is living in adultery, if someone's sleeping around and living a promiscuous lifestyle, if someone is bisexual or homosexual, that doesn't change the fact they're a human being created in the image of God. And Christ doesn't give me an option. He commands me to love all people. And the Jesus who, as he's dying on a cross, prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is modeling true tolerance. Tolerance is accepting people, regardless of how they behave, regardless of what they believe. Accepting people, because they're precious human beings created in the image of God. And that changes everything. Just talking about, like, official church doctrine. Yes. Catholic doctrine has to do with grace and works. Is that true? And if that's the case... Um, is that okay? I don't think it is. Okay, good. Fair question. You know, I like this guy. He's part of Young Life, and he's also Reformed yeah. in his theology. Okay? And Reformed theology places a great deal of emphasis on the sovereignty of God, the power of God. And I respect that. Highly. I probably am not as Reformed as he is. You think, Carter? <laughs> okay. I'm not as Reformed as he is. I don't look down on him. I don't think he looks down on me. In fact, I'm pretty sure he doesn't. I mean, this guy's embraced me like few people have and encouraged me, okay? So, what's the issue? I am convinced that the real issue is, is Jesus God? Yeah, they believe he's God. 
Did he live a sinless life? Yeah, he did. Did he bleed and die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin? Yes, he did. Three days later, did he rise from the dead? Yes, he did. Did he ascend to heaven? Yes, he did. Is he coming back a second time? Yes, he will be coming back a second time. Will there be a day of judgment? Yes, there will be. Will there be a heaven and hell? Yes, there will be. Do you need to put your faith in Christ? Yes, you do. Right, those are my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, they go to a Catholic church. No, I'm not a Catholic priest. Yes, I pastor a Protestant church, interdenominational, but they're my brothers and sisters. You know who are not my brothers and sisters? Those who say, I'm a Christian. Jesus was just a good teacher. I'm a Christian. Uh, well, the Bible really doesn't matter. You just make it up as you go along. I'm a Christian. Jesus rose spiritually, but not physically. No, 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 no. Jesus rose physically, unmistakably, Paul communicates in 1 Corinthians 15, unmistakably, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John communicate. A physical, bodily resurrection. So if you don't believe in the deity of Christ, and if you don't believe in a bodily resurrection, according to what I understand the scriptures to teach, then you're not a Christian. And as Carter and I were talking about, there are a lot of cultural Christians in America today. And many of them are Catholic and many of them are Protestant. And that's not where it's at. Where it's at is having a personal, spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ, where you trust in Him, and then that faith must be shown in lifestyle. And that is the main point of James and 1 John. James is not teaching the way to heaven is works. He is teaching the difference between sincere faith and insincere faith. And he points out very graphically, if I say I believe and I hate you, I'm a liar, as John puts it in 1 John 4. And James is saying, and if I say I believe in Jesus, and oh, you poor person, you just suck it up and try harder and I could give a rip about you. Oh, you're a liar, man. If the compassion of Christ doesn't move you to do something for hurting people, then your faith is probably insincere. You see, that's what I'm concerned about. Sincere faith in Christ. I am not so concerned about what church you go to. Yes, sir. Follow up. I'm not talking about the believers themselves. More about the church doctrine, like the, yes. what's on paper. Yes. Is it a problem if the official doctrine of the church, and it might not be anymore. John writes real clearly in 1 John 3. If I continue to sin, I don't know him. You've got to be real careful the way you parse that. Because I can promise you, Carter and Cliff sin every day in thought, attitude. But by golly, we better not habitually sin, which means we're just saying, hey, you know, I could give a rip Christ what you say. We're just going to do this. Then we're in real trouble. So you've got to be real careful the way you listen to a Catholic, listen to a Pentecostal, Listen to a Church of Christ, all right? I mean, there are some Church of Christ people who are jamming all over me. Cliff, you're preaching a false gospel because you don't preach baptism. I'm sorry, baptism is done in obedience to Christ. It's not the way to heaven. Same way with communion, in obedience to Christ. It's not the way to heaven. The Catholic Church has really changed. You want to really see a church that's changed? You talk to Carter about the Presbyterians. They got more divisions. <laughs> they got more... <laughs> splits then you can keep track of so just be very careful on this issue Stuart any thoughts on it well to take kind of a practical side yes the doctrine you got to be very careful with I mean I look we had somebody come to our church who was a pastor not too long ago and said you guys talk about Jesus here I thought wow I didn't I didn't know they existed and I guess they didn't know we existed pastors that talk about Jesus so it depends on the church. Yes, I would say it gets, it, it gets problematic with some of the churches I've spoken with. But like Cliff just said, there's many other churches we've spoken with, with within their doctrine. There's problems, too. They, they don't follow their main line churches. They, they deviate themselves and they make up these crazy doctrines. And you're like, where did you get that from? And so, yes, church tradition, you need to look at. But when I was at my last Mass, and I'm not Catholic, but when I was at my last Mass, the priest talked about Jesus in a very personal, relational way. And he understood that outside of just church tradition. And he understood grace. And my previous one, that was the case as well. And that's tremendously encouraging to me. As opposed to when I went to a Hindu temple not too long ago, it was their new year. 
these poor Hindu friends of mine had to play the same beat on a tambourine, changing every 45 minutes to the next person for 48 hours straight. If anybody got it wrong, they would have bad luck for the entire coming year. Okay, what is that? Well, that's doctrine that says we have to work hard to become more like God in order to really get to some type of paradise outside of reincarnation. And so whether it's the Catholic Church or, or other churches, whatever the doctrine might be, if you see legalism and a type of claim that you need to be better to get to God and to get to heaven, then you need to start raising up your hands and saying, hey, look, I agree to an extent, but what is grace? And obviously the theological terms are justification and sanctification. I'm justified in Christ, what Jesus did on the cross for me. Now sanctification is I want to grow in my faith Ethically, that's why everybody out here, especially those who are Christians, I would get into a community group, and a lot of you are, InterVarsity and others, where you have somebody at the end of a year say, hey, are you, how are you dealing with your anxiety disorder? Are you dealing with it in a way where you're growing towards Christ, you're becoming less anxious? Or are you becoming more anxious and fearful, saying, I don't feel like God's really with me on a daily basis? And so then you have somebody step in who's a fellow Christian and says, hey, let's grow together in understanding that we can trust God more and fear less. So that's the sanctification, and we need it in community, because if you do it alone, it's impossible to grow in faith by yourself. I'm trying to find my way to Christ, but in today's society and being taught science at a young age and finding it hard to do so, what advice would you give me? Mm. If there's an orderly mind that created this place, then there's got to be order like mathematics. Like gravity, gravitational pull, like the strong and weak forces, like the DNA strands that we have. Incredible order by a mind, a creative mind, not by some type of chance. The Pythagorean theorem, for example, that fits into an order that we didn't just create. We didn't just create mathematics. We didn't create science. There is no science out there. There are only scientists. In the sense of they see theory, they set theories. They set different principles in understanding how does this order make sense. So we were standing out here the other day, and somebody came up and said, you know, Africans, they only believe in, there's so many Africans who are Christians only because they were colonized, right? Here in the West. Well, here in the West, just because there was colonization, does that mean that two plus two doesn't equal four? I mean, I mean, no, objectively speaking, outside of colonization or anything like it, we believe that two plus two equals four because there's objective truth out there given by a lawgiver that sets these laws. That makes so much more sense than if we just popped out of simple chance out of nowhere, something coming from nothing, and all of a sudden you get this phenomenal order. The reason why the philosophy departments around here are all of a sudden changing from atheism to theism is because of one primary argument, and that is the fine-tuning argument. We talked about design right there, right? Fine-tuning is very similar. It's basically, I mean, look, you've got the content in one DNA molecule is just, it, it, it's, it's not even 500,000 movies. The content in 500,000 movies is about the same as one single DNA molecule, that, that amount of content. I mean, that's, that, that's mind-bending, right? If you shot a bullet from one side of the universe to the other side, that bullet would have to fit into an inch by inch square. That is the same chance, the, the chance of that happening is the same as our world having life-permitting causes, agents, where life could begin. Strong and neat, uh, weak nuclear forces, gravity. There's so many different types of things where philosophers here at the University of South Carolina are saying, you know what? It's pretty hard to say that there's not a God. Pretty hard to say at least that there's not a creative mind behind this because how things are set up so perfectly is pretty scary. Now, the religious departments, oddly enough, though, are becoming more secular. They're saying, you know what? If you start espousing supernatural beliefs, I'm gonna lose all my book sales here. And I might get fired from the University of South Carolina. So I'm not gonna talk about any type of evidence for the resurrection. No way. 
Even if I believe that there's credible evidence, I'm never going to talk about that. So in terms of science and in terms of bias and thinking through it, that's what you got to contend with. Okay. Thank you. Now, that's a great question. All right. Troy Van Voorhis is a professor at MIT, and he gives an analogy that I love. If I ask you, why is your shirt orange? Why are you wearing that shirt? Why is it orange? There are two different ways to answer it. You could chemically analyze the orange pigment. And you could say, the reason that my shirt is orange is because of this chemical component. Yes, you could also say, my mother likes me in orange. Both would be true. But you see, they are dealing with reality from two different angles. One is dealing it with it from a purely physical, material angle. The color pigment, the chemicals in this are blue. That's why this shirt is blue. But I have a relationship with my wife. She likes me in blue, and that's why this shirt is blue that I'm wearing. It's a statement of relationship, a relationship with my wife. That's why I'm wearing a blue shirt. Someone who says, Science contradicts faith in Christ is making a tragic mistake. Science is a beautiful study of process. Science has nothing to do with relationship. Please never go on a scientific date. It'll be a total failure. A person is not an object that you chemically analyze. A person is a human being with a mind, emotions, will, and you can build a companionship, a friendship with the person, the human being. When I was at MIT speaking, I found out that there was a student at MIT dating their computer. That's sad. That is tragic. Why? Because what you're doing is you're reducing reality to simply the material the electrical. You are not a computer. You're not a robot. And she is not a computer or a robot. You're human beings with minds, emotions, conscience, free will. Learn to build a relationship with a human being as well as learn to do good science. But don't get the two mixed up. And don't think that one contradicts the other. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church, located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.